Hello. Today's video is going to look at the link between traditional love poetry and some of the more modern romantic poems in the Relationships Anthology. And you might be asking yourself, well, why bother, sir? I'm on YouTube. I could be watching a man fart the national anthem. Why sit here listening to your dumb shtick? Well, pin back those big flapping ears and I'll tell you, because if we can say to what extent one of these modern poems is like and unlike the sonnets, the love poetry of centuries gone, we've got some pretty high-end context on our hands. The sort of context that screams, give me my high grade, you noddy, in no uncertain terms, to that examiner. Now we're not going to get bogged down in technical terminology, words like Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnets or halters. That doesn't suit our purpose here. This definition, this simple definition of a sonnet, works perfectly. It's a poetic form that traditionally presents ideas about romantic love in a very tightly structured 14 lines. And I can't say I'm a huge fan of sonnets. To me, they're just a mother load of mush, a real yuck fest of slushy sentimentality. And they tend to whitewash over a lover's flaws, focusing on the lover as this figure of perfection, this flawless gem of womanhood or manhood. Sadly, the internet yields very few contextual truffles for this Jen Hadfield lassie. I mean, I prayed I'd find out she'd been married four or five times because that would have linked beautifully with the poem's cynical, critical view of love. But alas, I couldn't find anything like that. So I'm going to think about how love's dog is similar and different to, to traditional love poetry. And clock the stuff in blue there. I'm looking at the structure of Hadfield's poem here. There's a fixed rhyme scheme to it and that echoes or reflects the fixed rhyme scheme of sonnets. However, there is a difference in terms of content. Sonnets, as we say, idealise lovers. Here we see a more bleaker, cynical depiction of love. You've got that pain and misery running parallel with the joy of love, aren't you? But we can drill down deep into the contextual catacombs by considering why Hadfield's poem is different in its approach to love than traditional sonnets. Perhaps we can attribute Hadfield cynicism to the high divorce rate of the 20th and 21st century. Maybe that explains her cynical, negative depiction of love. And cook that little lot up together and you can craft a contextual paragraph to wow them in the exam. Now, what I'm saying here is the way Hadfield's poem is and is not like traditional love poetry. And then I'm deepening my focus, as discussed, by considering the reasons for Hadfield's different perspective on love. Duffy's Valentine pushes the romantic angle, but both in form and content, it goes against, it defies the conventions of traditional love poetry. Valentine is crafted using free verse. It shakes free from the shackles of structural restraint. And like that daft love's dog, it presents a bleaker view of relationships, romantic relationships. It doesn't sugarcoat love. You know, it accepts that love is this horrid hell brew of pain and angst in which your sanity dissolves pretty darn quickly. Yes, you've seen this contextual detail before. That's part of my recycling policy. It's the same reason, but attributed to Valentine this time, not love's dog, considering why Duffy has that cynical tone, those pessimistic ideas permeating her poem. With a bit of cut and paste, I've cannibalised bits, I've borrowed bits from the Love's Dog paragraph to roll out an equally insightful, equally articulate discourse on Valentine's contextual connection to sonnets. If you don't like it, tough, go tarmac a ceiling, because it's going to make the examiner's millennium. Wendy Cope's First Date is another poem that we can fruitfully compare with traditional love poetry. Again, there are similarities and differences. You've got a fixed rhyme scheme at the first date, and that echoes or parallels the rigid structure of the sonnet. However, in terms of content, they're quite different. A sonnet, as we said, celebrates, eulogises, idealises love or the lover. In this poem, First Date, you've got two people trying to muzzle their true feelings for fear of appealing too keen in the relationship. People trying to hide and conceal and deceive about their true emotions. Well, I'll be a blooming moomin. I've only done it again, haven't I? I've stitched together a wonderful paragraph, a rapturous tapestry of top grade examiner candy. Again, clock the stuff in blue at the bottom. That's me alluding to 
why the change in tone or perspective with regards copes with love compared with traditional sonnets. The final poem that we'll look at today comes from Mancunian word wizard John Cooper Clarke. In his I Want to Be Yours, he reveals quite an ambivalent or ambiguous or confused relationship with traditional love poetry. On the one hand, you've got that fixed rhyme scheme which predominates, which means it's mainly there until the end, of course. That reflects the rigid structure of the sonnets. On the other hand, he's quite the comma killer, quite the full stop dropper, our Cooper Clark, isn't he? There's not one dollop of punctuation in that entire poem. On that score, that is going against the formal conventions of traditional poetry. Having said that, you look at the outpouring of intense romantic passion that he peddles in this poem, that is very like traditional love poetry, with that undisguised, unalloyed adoration for a lover pouring forth. And we can enrich that contextual link between a modern and a traditional romantic poem by considering why the newer one is different. Don't forget, Cooper Clark was growing up during the 1960s, a time known as the birth of the permissive society. Um, you had the contraceptive pill, which means people have a lot more sex consequence free. You didn't have to pay the price nine months later. And it meant there was a more casual attitude towards sex that we see in this poem. I don't want to be hers, he says. I want to be yours. He's happy to drop one woman like a hot snot and take up with the other. That's a very casual attitude towards sex or extramarital sex or premarital sex, whatever. So we're seeing the society, the modern society that shaped Cooper Clark produces a poem very different to those of 200, 300, 400 years ago. And proof, if further proof were needed, that Mr Taylor's work is a flawless fusion of beauty and brains. Let this fine paragraph, taking ideas from the previous slides, enchant your eyeballs. Level nine, you bet your life it is. You bet your life. And so, to recap, to wrap it up with a velvet bow, traditional love poems like sonnets tend to have a fixed rhyme scheme and also they try to idealise or glorify a lover or the idea of love. And if we can comment on how a modern romantic poem is similar or different to traditional love poetry, with a legitimate contextual point on our hands, a contextual point that we can deepen, if we're a canny Danny or a brainy Amy or a quick Rick, we can deepen by ruminating on the reasons, the possible causes as to why modern romantic poetry has a more critical or casual attitude towards love and romance. And we're done. Now I'll tell you something, ladles and jelly spoons, boils and grills. I do not claim to be easy on the eye, but, and you can take this to the bank, this video will help craft something soul-meltingly beautiful into the contextual sections of your poetry exam responses. And so, on that note, I shall leave you good people today. Wish the very best of luck in that example.